All right, thank you and good afternoon. Let's go to the next slide, please. We're gonna talk about this issue in the context of a discipline we use to understand interactions in the grid. Uh, it starts with this concept of system architecture, which is a discipline used widely in many industries for a variety of purposes. And we add to that uh, some things that are specialized for the grid network theory and control theory and so on and focus it on the grid and we call that grid architecture. But the purpose of all of this is to understand large scale systems in a somewhat abstract way, but um, being able to understand its properties. So we think of the grid or any of these systems as a set of black box components means we don't worry about what's inside them. Structure, the way the boxes or components are related or connect to each other and the externally visible characteristics that we get. You can see that there are a lot of different purposes there. Um, one of the things that we do is use this to think about the coordination problem for transmission and distribution, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. Next slide, please. So the coordination problem has become one of the largest problems in grid modernization. And it's because of the proliferation of assets that can participate in the operation of the grid, but may not be owned or directly controlled by the utility, largely distributed energy resources. So uh, operationally aligning all of that is what we really mean by coordination. Um, and that is a, a significant problem because of the fact that you have multiple owners and multiple ways to control these things. So the 20th century grid, did not evolve with that concept in mind and consequently things have been developing organically to try to deal with this and that has led to some issues with coordination some structural problems that have evolved and we're going to take a look at those on the next slide so one of the things that can happen is hidden coupling and it can occur in a number of different ways we have a couple of examples here if you have a device um, let's say this is a, a rooftop solar inverter or a storage unit or any number of things behind the, uh, the service transformer. And you have two different processes that are somehow trying to control it, such as, for example, two different processes trying to uh, use prices to devices methods to get it to do something. They can end up fighting each other. They can be in conflict if there's not a coordination between them. And we've actually seen this happen with one process overriding the prices left by another process. In the middle, another way this happens is two different control mechanisms um, manipulating devices that are on the same service transformer secondary. And because they're connected together at that level, there can be a conflict with those as well. And we've seen some of that with utilities controlling some assets and DER operators controlling others. And then finally, the one that we're mostly concerned with on the right there, a transmission system operator. That would be something like an independent system operator or a regional transmission operator or the equivalent um, in those areas where we don't have that structure, who's responsible on a large scale, but is now managing things that are at, connected at the distribution level when the distribution operator is responsible for distribution operations and reliability. So that can cause a hidden coupling through the distribution grid itself. And it may not always be obvious that this is happening. And let's look at the next, next slide to see why. When you look at the skeleton of all of this, and that's the way we, we break this down. You can look at what happens with the lines of coordination, and we can identify those fairly easily. Um, and you see some things happening here. On the left, you see this thing called tier bypassing. There's a line of coordination that goes from the system operator down to past the distribution company, down to assets at the distribution level. And in the middle, you see that double-ended red arrow there. That's a place where there's a gap in coordination. There's no coordination between the system operator and the distribution company. And those are both things that lead to those hidden coupling problems that we just talked about. Next slide. Of course, it can be harder to recognize in real situations. This is a, an industry structure model. We use these to understand on a regional basis how the various entities involved interact with each other. And these are multi-level diagrams. So there's quite a lot of detail here, which we won't go into today. But the thing is, this is the, the environment, this is the, uh, the background this, uh, that you're making these changes in when you're thinking about coordination. It's kind of like um, having a, a tapestry. And if you tug on a thread someplace, it's going to bunch up somewhere else. And you like to know that before you start to do things. In other words, you like to know about potential unintended consequences. And that can be quite difficult because of the complexity of the systems that you see on a regional basis. Next slide. So we started to look at this problem in terms of 
how could we think about it in a rigorous basis? And I'm not going to make you do any math today. I will just tell you that we used a mathematical basis to derive a structural framework to think about coordination. And that structural framework has some nice properties. It gives us a building block that we can apply at all kinds of different levels in order to think about how to put together a coordination framework that can operate from top to bottom and whose properties we'll understand. The, the basis for this uh, gives us the ability to solve problems in a variety of different ways. So we haven't picked a particular set of equations to solve or anything like that. Uh, we're more interested in the structure, but it allows for allocation type solutions, that is to say direct control type solutions, and it al allows for price-like methods, in other words, market type solutions, and you can even intermix those in this arrangement. It's very scalable. Um, and it can be built out on a proportional basis when you're implementing it. So it has a lot of good characteristics, and this is a much better approach than saying, well, let's just start drawing some lines and connect some boxes together and see if we can make things work. You'll notice that there is a building block in there. It's inside that red square in the lower diagram there. And if we look at the next slide, we can see how we can apply that. This is what we call a framework. That means we can develop any number of specific architectures that map onto any particular grid and can do so at multiple levels. So we can apply this clear down at the individual device level, even inside a microgrid or building if we wanted to, or on the regional level. And that means that it helps us understand the issue of transmission distribution coordination and helps us understand a lot about how the roles and responsibilities might have to evolve going forward. You'll see a new term there, DSO, and we're gonna talk about that a lot in this discussion, distribution system operator. Let's go to the next slide. The architecture uh, development that we just talked about gives us some simple rules for how these things should be structured. So we remember this little coordination framework diagram on the left that we just looked at a minute ago. The framework gives us some simple rules to allow us to transform that into something that does not have the problems we identified, the tier bypassing and gapping. When you do that, you get a diagram like the one on the right. And that automatically starts to inform about what that new thing called distribution system operator ought to be. So it helps you understand what the roles and responsibilities are that go with that and helps you understand about the interfaces between that and other parts of the system. Next slide, please. Because of that, you can understand now why you would say that the distribution system operator would have a, a role that involves how, how things transpire at the interface between transmission distribution and allows the distribution system to look very different. It allows it to look like a virtual resource. So at that interface, you come to an agreement about the exchange of energy and services and so on. And that changes the nature of the relationship between distribution and transmission, but it gives you a powerful new way to think about how those two can be coordinated together how that gap that we showed before gets filled in, what the nature of the roles and responsibilities are, and what the nature of the interfaces are, and what kinds of information should flow across them. Next slide, please. So people have given a great deal of thought to this, and Paul in particular has worked on this with Lorenzo, Christoph, and others, to define some thinking about what is a distribution system operator. And there's a spectrum of models that they have thought about. On the left, sort of one bookend, is what they call the total transmission system operator. And there, the optimization and all of the dispatch and so on are very centralized at the transmission system operator level. The DSO still has some responsibilities, but they are mainly uh, operation, reliable operation of the distribution network and providing visibility of that to the, to the to TSO. And the customer or aggregator coordinates with the transmission system operator in that model. All the way over on the other side, the other bookend called total DSO model is very different in that the transmission system operator still optimizes the bulk system, but it sees distribution as a single virtual or aggregated resource managed by the distribution system operator. It doesn't have visibility deep into the distribution system. The distribution system operator is responsible for all that physical coordination and aggregation of services at that interface. And the customer or aggregator um, only deals with the DSO in that case. In between, there are a range of hybrid models, which are compromises between those two in essence. They're more complicated in the sense that they split up the roles and responsibilities in different ways. 
um, and require that the customer or aggregator coordinate with both the TSO and DSO. Uh, but we see a lot of that thinking going on, uh, not just in the US industry, but around the world. Next slide, please. So let's look at these a little bit more in diagram fashion. The total uh, TSO model, the one that was all the way on the left, you can see everything flows back to the transmission system operator. All those lines are flowing uphill to the TSO, and you see how the aggregator deals with the TSO and how the, even the, the demand response programs deal with that. And the distribution operator, in a sense, is off to the side. There may be some amount of information exchange to help do coordination, um, but fundamentally, really, all of the, the real management of the whole system is at the TSO level. Next slide, please. So the hybrid model, this is the one that was in between on our spectrum, is more complicated. You can see now that you've got lines flowing to both the transmission system operator and the distribution operator, and you've also got uh, a stronger line, more coordination between the TSO and the DSO here. But just by the nature of the way this is structured, you see there's more complication going on here. And in practice, where we've looked at this around the world, these things, these hybrid models get a lot more complicated than even what we're showing here. Next slide, please. Then finally, the one that was all the way on the right on our spectrum, the total DSO model, you can see is very simply structured and you see that clean interface between transmission and distribution. And you see that the distribution system operator is responsible for managing all the things that happen at the distribution level, including handling the aggregations. So that gives you a sense of the kinds of structures that people are thinking about. There are lots of variations on this, especially in the hybrid models. Um, and a lot of thinking going on around the industry in the US and in other countries about exactly how to do this and how to get from where things are today to some version of this kind of coordination going forward. Next slide, please. So the process of doing that, um, both for the utilities and for the regulators is, is not simple necessarily because of the complexity. Remember that industry structure diagram I showed and how complicated it is. That complexity can really be a problem if you don't have an organized approach to attacking this. So, so Paul had laid out a kind of an organized approach to it that you see here with four basic steps that help either the utilities or the regulators or both think their way through this process of getting to a coordination framework. And the start, first one always starts with the thing that you always want to begin with is what are your objectives? And then what capabilities will you need to meet those objectives from there you can think about documenting and you should document what kind of structure you have now in your system. And if it is changing, if it's emerging, think about documenting that as well, because you need to know where you're starting from if you're going to make these changes. And then you can take a look at some alternative arrangements for coordination structures, maybe selected from within that spectrum that we talked about, um, and do evaluation on them finally in terms of both operational effectiveness and risks and naturally always in terms of what it's gonna to take to do it and what the cost would be. So you can be very organized in a stepwise fashion on how to think your way through this process. Along the way, there are various things that you can draw from the grid architecture work to help you without having to be doing the architecture work yourself, but there are basic principles that help you at each stage of this. So let's talk a little bit about the evaluation process. Next slide, please. So there's some key things to think about in, in the, uh, both the operational effectiveness and risk area. Um, on the top there, you see several things that are listed as effectiveness. So things that you wanna think about are how much observability each of the entities needs. It depends on what type of model you're thinking about, how much does the DSO need to know, how much does the TSO need to know, and how much do they need to share. You wanna think about that because that has a big impact on the information flows that are gonna be necessary to perform coordination. You want to think about scalability. There are a lot of schemes around for how to integrate DER um, and do transmission distribution coordination that haven't thought out very well what happens when the quantities of, of DERs get large. A lot of things work well at small scale on the grid. In other words, you don't see the problems that are inherent in them. And then when they scale up, you start to see these operational problems. And you'd like to be able to know that the approach you're going to take is going to scale up nicely as the level of DER increases. Naturally, you want to think about the issues of whether you're creating or uh, exacerbating cyber vulnerabilities, because we're always concerned about that. And some kinds of structures, 
expose grid systems to more vulnerability than others do. And that's something that can be analyzed along with the rest of the work. And then thinking about the layer decomposition model, that's that framework we looked at a little while ago, helps you break this down into a set of sub problems that are manageable. So that building block approach that we talked about in, in putting together uh, uh, an architecture for doing coordination, um, this is a very helpful thing to do in terms of being effective. Some of the risks that we talked about, we already looked at tier bypassing and hidden coupling. We talked about those early on in the presentation. One more that we hadn't mentioned so far is what we call latency cascading. Some schemes for doing coordination uh, require information to be passed through many different stages, many different organizations. And every time you do that, you create some time to delay. That's what we mean by latency. If you start to stack those up because you have to go through many different organizations to get through one cycle of processing, that's what we mean by latency cascading. And too much of that is problematic because um, you start to develop instabilities in the overall operation of the system when that becomes large. So you try to minimize the amount of latency cascading that goes on, and that's a structural consideration and a risk that you would want to consider in doing all of this. Working with people who are familiar with architecture issues can help you sort all this out. It's not as difficult as it may sound. Um, once you figure out how to lay out and depict these things, it's actually pretty straightforward. Next slide, please. So some things to think about. Um, a lot of the approaches to DER coordination now, to transmission distribution coordination, have some of the problems we talked about, tier bypassing, hidden coupling, cyber vulnerabilities. And a lot of that really comes about in the sort of hybrid approaches, especially if they are being developed on an ad hoc basis. Um, the future models that we see people thinking about kind of have roughly two schools of thought. One is a centralized approach uh, with the TSO sort of doing everything and then layered approaches where the DSO has a significant role, which may vary a little bit depending on exactly how people want to do it. A lot of folks are looking at hybrid models as an intermediate step to get to one or the other of these, and those hybrid models can get kind of complicated, so you want to sort of be a little bit cautious about that. And then finally, we've laid out a simple model, the building block model that we call layered decomposition that I showed you, and the Occam process to help you think your way through how this is going to be structured. And that works at many different levels, including at the regional transmission distribution level. Next slide, please. 